Hello, I'm Paula Blair and this is another of my film and audiovisual studies series. This is the seventh of the cinema and the American avant-garde videos and we'll be focusing this time on the work of Shirley Clark. Just before we begin, a quick reminder to hit that subscribe button below so that you don't miss any of these videos. A lot of these in the current series speak back and forth to each other, so do go back to the start and have a look through with anything you might have missed. Now just to note that as with if you watched the Warhol video a couple of videos ago you'll know that these are taken from a module I delivered in 2013 and I haven't updated the material for these. I was procrastinating too much and I thought it best to just get them out there and then hopefully later when I've got more time and space to study I will try and update these and put improved videos out there. Now as with the Warhol one for this lecture I don't have my full notes so I'm just going to be working off the slides that you can see on screen. I'm fairly sure I did do an updated improved lecture on Shirley Clark a bit later than this so I may come to this when I come to work on a different module but for now we'll just do some basics on Shirley Clark. She was born Shirley Brimberg in 1919 and she died in 1997. She trained as a dancer and had great aspirations of being a professional dancer. I think it turned out that she just wasn't quite good enough. I think she worked semi-pro for a while but she just didn't quite have the talent required to go full professional. She began filmmaking in the 1950s and from very early on she she was already unconventional. She shifted across different modes of working with ease. She felt the sting of the reality that women were very much set aside and marginalised in the criticism of film and really had to fight and vie for space in a very overwhelmingly male world. Like so many of the people we're looking at in this set of lectures, she lived in New York in the 1950s and 60s. A lot of the films she made are set and filmed in New York. But interestingly, again, like a lot of the other ones, she ended up moving west. She lectured at UCLA from 1975, and I believe that they have quite an extensive archive on her, which is something that's a bit of a dream for me to go and visit someday, but I really don't think that'll ever happen. If you remember, or if you go back to the video on Maya Deren, New York City was a really vibrant place for women filmmakers. There were pockets, especially especially the Greenwich Village area where they were very anti-bourgeois and really bohemian. Women were renouncing their traditional roles as stay-at-home mothers and having to have a very quiet, monogamous, heterosexual sexuality. Very generally, the women in this crowd, so these were people who were probably attached to Fluxus and the happenings and the likes of Warhol's group in the factory his friends that were hanging out there, the people who were hanging out in the Chelsea Hotel. A lot of these people were involved in making films and making art and writing books. They were very open about their interests in sex and taking drugs, which of course are very male dominated areas. In our last video, I was looking at Kenneth Anger and his are male dominated in a different way because he's got a gay or a queer gaze when he's looking at men and that was taboo enough. But women having and expressing sexuality is really just too much. So Maya Darren, who we did look at before and who lived between 1917 and 61, she was an unofficial group leader in the Greenwich Village pocket of these artists. She really strongly promoted filmmaking as a significant art form alongside poetry, painting and music. I think cinema and film is still fighting for its place to be considered as a serious art form alongside these more accepted and more established forms. Film is of course extremely young in terms of creative media. But as we looked at before, Darren was a theorist of film as well as a filmmaker. So she was somebody who was really trying to buck that trend of not talking about it or talking about it in derogatory terms. 
And she was very much trying to look at, again, more marginalised ways of making films because even in criticism, there were norms and conventions that had become established and she was working hard to break that. A really important event, certainly in the lore or the history, whatever way you read the history and you look at it, it really establishes women's place in avant-garde filmmaking and I suppose avant-garde creative production very generally. In 1959, the musician Bibi Barron had a baby shower. Bibi and her husband Louis Barron were pioneers in electronic music in 19. 19- 1956, for example, they created a really experimental and distinctive score for the film Forbidden Planet. That's probably what they're most famous for. The Barons were part of this New York crowd and they held this baby shower where a lot of these women in the Greenwich Village scene in the 50s came and attended and it ended up becoming a regular support group. And then in more feminist histories of this period, it retrospectively became politicised. I think a lot of historians were looking back and thinking, well, the idea of womanhood was changing in the post-Second World War era. This in turn changes the idea of motherhood. It starts to become synonymous with fulfilment and this was getting linked with consumerism and being a good mother was about buying the right things for your child and fulfilling their dreams and making sure they have everything and could want for nothing and this was contrasted by increasing amounts of women beginning careers and in this Greenwich Village scene a lot of the people involved were taking alternative approaches to these things they were having children but it wasn't ending their careers or as I described in a previous video the likes of Mary Menken and Willard Mass, who had a child together even though he was gay and they had a what we would consider now as an alternative family unit. It's heteronormative on the surface of it but it's actually a queered family unit if that makes sense. So there was a lot of this queering of the norm happening and full-on rejections of the norm happening too. And I think just to continue thinking about these ideas of histories and compiling histories an overarching question over this module that I delivered in 2013 was how can we disrupt the canon of the avant-garde and the American avant-garde when they're so male and yet there were so many women who were actually involved. I think Shirley Clark is an example of someone who wasn't marginal in the way she had to become. She's somebody who's forced out of history and then has to be reinserted because she was very much in the throng of everything. So if we think about art history in a very general sense, creativity is so often associated with men. We're led to believe really for a long time that women just weren't making art, women just weren't painting, but actually these were modes of expression that were kept from them. Women were having to write under pseudonyms and make themselves appear to be male so that they could get published. One of the difficulties I think in women being recognised is that their work so often isn't considered as womanly and the stereotypes that come with what we think of as womanhood or womanliness. So even when women's work was accepted in some way or allowed in some way, usually as lesser than what the men were doing, but when it was allowed to take place, say, they were set aside in their own category and excluded from the main canons that we're looking at. So these patriarchal power structures actively excluded them when, as I say, they were really in the throes of all of it. They were pioneering the work. They were pioneering techniques. They were working with new technologies. They were disrupting the idea that they were meant to be wives and mistresses to the artists. They were supposed to prop up the great men. To be an artist as a woman was deemed improper because to be an artist is also to be a lover, a Casanova type figure. It's someone who can have affairs here and there, can travel the world, who is exempt from the constraints of a bourgeois life. But for women to do any of this, to engage in any of these behaviours is unthinkable. 
as women had you know there was no choice for governments to allow women into workplaces out of pure necessity during the war efforts in the post-war time those women who had jobs were finding themselves surplus to requirements because the men were coming back they were increasingly marginalized and by the 1950s well into the 1950s you have these re-established norms of what women are supposed to do what their function is supposed to be and of course with that taste of freedom who would want to go back to that and so the avant-garde provided opportunities that the mainstream could not give them because these were women who were never going to make a movie in Hollywood. There was Hitchcock and there was Douglas Sirk and you know there were jobbing directors that belonged to studios who were there specifically to make the works the way the producers wanted them made and the women were never going to get even that but the avant-garde that was where they could have a go and they could try working in these really fascinating areas of creativity that they wanted to try out there are readings of the American avant-garde that can identify stages and particularly women's films. So with Darren comes the emergence, if you read it this way, of psychonarration, okay, which is a different way of putting it than we've looked at before in the module. So whether you think her films are psychodramas or not, there's certainly something going on with the subconscious mind and stories are being told. So psychonarration is probably quite appropriate. With Clark working in the late 50s and the 1960s, you have a burst of social realism with her. So her films are edgy, they're really out there, they have experimental techniques, but the content in them is very, very real and very directly related to issues that were parallel with the civil rights movement that was emerging as well. Then a bit later on in the 70s and 80s with Joyce Wayland, who was married for a time to Michael Snow, who we're going to look at later in the module. And the only reason I've never taught Joyce Wayland is because I've never got hold of any of her work. I'd love to have taught Joyce Wayland, but with her, you were getting overtly feminist disputes with the explosion of second wave feminism in the 1970s and with feminist film theory as well, centered around scholars like Laura Mulvey. So 1975 is when her very famous essay about the male gaze in cinema comes out and this sends a bit of a bolt through film scholarship. And so there will be filmmakers who were aware of all of that and that really starts to change the game. This progression in women's cinema, women's filmmaking, can be aligned with the dominant direction of post-war independent cinema as well in a broad way and in a sense there are relations to the mainstream because in Hollywood in the 1940s there were a spate of films that were about psychoanalysis so Hitchcock again was central to that with Spellbound the 1950s and 60s you had new wave movements springing up in Europe and Britain and that came to the US in the form of New Hollywood. You did start to get the emergence of more women filmmakers in Hollywood and certainly probably more writers and things than there had been for a long time or at least acknowledged later in the 20th century. It's still a battle at all times but there are these very broad parallels happening Clark was very vocal about what she was trying to do. She worked very hard on drawing American independent cinema into more mainstream distribution and exhibition and was trying hard to make it less marginalised. And she said that experimental film is one of the little stilettos we can put into the commercial world so that eventually the kind of film we're talking about can get to bigger audiences. She was very much wanting these kinds of films to be made and for them to start to reach the kinds of audiences and the volume of audience that more commercial films were getting. She wanted there to be a collapse between independent and studio system films in terms of their streams of distribution and where they were being exhibited, what kinds of venues would show the films. She was also part of a group that was resisting the narcissism and hegemony 
as she saw it, of abstract expressionism. This came up quite a bit when we were looking at Stan Brakhage a few videos ago because she felt that the sort of work that he was making and work similar to that was in being so personal and being so about the self was really narcissistic and not very helpful. I mean, Clark's sums were not about her kind of life at all. They were about other people and they were about showing what the world isn't saying. They were about really marginalised African-American communities and people who we would since consider as perhaps an underclass, people who are caught in cycles of drug addiction and unemployment and can't get out of them and they're living in slum areas. She was very concerned with with people's rights and human rights and equality. She came from a very privileged position as a white middle class woman. Her films were about something, they were always about something, whereas with abstract expressionism they're not about anything necessarily. It's images and colours and it's shapes and it's swirls of different things. It's about itself and she didn't want to make films that were about themselves or about her. So she became really drawn into documentary filmmaking and a rhetoric of social relevancy. Her films had to matter, they had to be about topics that mattered and were striving for social change in real terms. There was a real rejection of the notion of art for art's sake, for example. A quick run through of Clark's work. Her first her first film, her first short, was Dance in the Sun in 1953. There are striking similarities between that film and Darren's dance films, in particular Ritual and Transfigured Time. And there's quite an interesting history behind that because Clark had never seen any of Darren's work before making the film. It was actually, I think, several years afterwards that somebody introduced her to Maya Darren's work and then they met later on in the 1950s but in 1953 she didn't know about her at all. They're really fascinating films to watch side by side. In the 1960s Clark was pretty integral to the new American cinema movement. Really in her practice she took Darren's model so if you remember from that video I talked about Darren's anagram where she outlines a system for film. Clark expanded upon that and included a commercial cinematic system and diversity so she wanted documentary to figure in this as well, not just fiction. And her emphases on these concerns are clear in her films from the early 1960s, The Connection from 1961, Robert Frost, A Lover's Quarrel with the World, made in around 1963, and The Cool World in 1963. What I looked at in the original session with my students was two different films. I showed one of Clark's earlier short films and it was something that combined the dance film and documentary documentary in a really radical way. Bridges Go Round from 1958 was Clark's most critically acclaimed experimental film. So the whole film is looking at immobile objects. As the title says, it's the bridges around New York City and they were filmed in such a way to give them movement and give parts of them the appearance of being in flow, of being in dance moves. The formal techniques used were colour tint saturation it's a really vibrant film in terms of what colours are used. There are different colour tints over black and white film. There's a lot of low angles making the bridges look really imposing and really emphasising the lines of all the cables and bars, keeping them suspended. There's a lot of backlighting, so these massive structures are silhouetted. They appear much darker in the frame. There's a lot of zooming going on, so there's a lot of flattening of space and objects. There's a lot of superimposition, mirroring and doubling within the frames. So you might be seeing the image of the bridge but the mirror image of that image is overlaid on top of it and they're swirling around and they're moving with each other. So it's as if the bridge is almost like it's dancing with itself sometimes. 
Further formal techniques include the camera movement. This is a camera that is never static. It is constantly moving in lots of different ways. You know, there's pivoting, panning, handheld. There's all sorts of movement in the camera as well as in the lenses, as I say, with the zoom. That combined in the editing with superimposition evokes fluid motion and gives the bridges, these hefty, hefty objects, a sense of weightlessness. There's choreography coming through in the these inanimate objects and this is invoking an emotional reaction at times because it's it's hard to describe I think you do need to sit and watch it and I think the music whichever version you watch really helps with this it's a bit like when you do watch a dance and you can't explain why but it makes you feel something and so her dance background and choreography background emerges really strongly in this film and so much of that response comes from how she's edited it one of the things she was fairly famous for saying was that she would admit to being quite rubbish at filming things but it was in the edit that was where her talents lie was in editing things and she had an eye for where things should be cut and how they should be put together there's a relation here to cinematic dance this is coming after you know a pretty established tradition in Hollywood of dance musicals for example and high level choreography in those she'll be very aware of this you know instead of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire you've got the Bridges of New York dancing with each other so this film was released with two different scores I can't remember the ins and outs of it but I think there were legal implications involved. One of the scores, I think it was a jazz score and the other one was an electronic score. They're really interesting to watch back to back because you can really get into examining the relationship between sound and the movement but also the way the films have been coloured. So what are we hearing at any time when red is on screen or green or purple or whatever it is? The colours keep changing and does that change the mood along with the music? So it's really ripe for audiovisual study, I think, the two versions of this film. The second film Um, I suppose third if you count Bridges Go Round as two different films but the longer film that we looked at was Portrait of Jason from 1967. I find this film hugely fascinating. It was the first time a feature length film of I think any kind focused entirely on a one participant shall we say. You could call him an actor because of the nature of the person but certainly participant so it featured Jason Holiday, whose real name was Aaron Payne he was a gay hustler he was African-American he had been a singer in Greenwich Village and this preceded the Stonewall riots and the gay rights movement it's also coinciding with the civil rights movement. It's quite a joy to watch, but it's also really painful. It's filmed over quite a short period of time, but I suppose in a way it's quite a long period of time because it's filmed in these sessions where he's just drinking and talking. He's telling all of his anecdotes from his life and you don't really know how much is embellished and how much is true. It gets quite explicit at times. It gets pretty harrowing at times. It's really funny at times. He's a really engaging aging flamboyant storyteller so much of the film rests on him telling and telling and telling all these stories and naming all these people but also I suppose the meme you can take from the film is him going I'll never tell after telling and telling and telling he says I'll never tell I'll keep the secrets when he's literally just been talking at a camera for a really long time if I remember correctly it was filmed over maybe a night might have been one night possibly two but it feels like it's all in one go and they just kept going and she just kept asking him questions he would go off on another story he would get tired and lie down but then she'd find the right thing to spark up his conversation again and he would go off again and I think how it's edited together and the order in which his anecdotes appear they're really fascinating to examine so I think it's pretty hard to get your hands on or at least it's very expensive to get your hands on so if you can't access a university library 
tree that has it. Hopefully someday you'll be able to see it. I think it's a really fascinating film. It's a really fascinating examination of this personality and where a gay black man can fit in society at this time. It's a really important document of that. A few words on institutionalization because this is again something that comes up a fair bit in this module of lectures. Clark is working at a time in the late 1960s where universities and galleries and museums are becoming interested in independent film. The sorts of films that were not of interest to scholarship or histories before are suddenly getting a bit of attention and becoming institutionalised. So modes of working that were beyond the institutions and the commercial mainstream, people are starting to pay attention and think actually somebody should be documenting this. In return, it seemed that they would begin to provide support networks for makers. But because these are institutions and often involve some sort of government funding, they have had to follow institutional agendas and structures. This actually started to exclude women even more than before. The laws around taxes and funding started to change and fewer women could access these. Clark had really been able to access stuff because of her husband anyway. He was very supportive of her career. I didn't really go into that much of a a biography of her in this but she married quite young to an older man and she ended up having affairs and getting divorced but I think she and her husband remained good friends and he was hugely supportive of her work as he helped her access a lot of funds. So, you know, I think behind just about any woman that we're talking about here, there was usually a man or a network of men who were allies and supporters and patrons. So that was really how they were even getting anything done. But with things changing and with the accessibility suddenly to the new medium of video, as we talked about before, there was somewhere to jump to. So a lot of the pioneers of video art, video making, video documentary and home video were women. People like Clark shifted over to video because it meant that they could make the work they wanted to make without any impediment. Now the thing with video that's fascinating was the appeal of how instant it was. It was immediate, it was live, it was in the moment. You could replay it quickly. So as we talked about with Warhol's work, that example of inner and outer space, where they could shoot something with an actor and then play that on a monitor and then shoot the next bit while that's playing. This really benefited many artists who were finding themselves with even less access to film than ever before. And it's interesting because I think it's Clark's daughter whose name is escaping me. I think she was really central to the home video style that came about in the 1980s that really pushed the technology and it really explored questions around the self and I suppose methods around diary, being a diarist because you didn't have to write it down anymore and so much of women's writing was in the form of diary and so it really, the medium came to develop those approaches to making work as well and using the self as central to art making. The questions I left my students with as we went straight into watching Bridges Go Round and Portrait of Jason were in both think about dance and rhythm because with Portrait of Jason as well there are elements of (laughs) I suppose even in terms of the language that he uses and the way Jason carries himself there's elements of posing and dancing and I suppose it's really interesting if you're aware of Paris is Burning it's earlier than that of course but it was a documentary made in in the late 80s and came out in 1990 about the drag balls in New York. Jason's almost like a precursor to those people. You know, he's, if you watch him, there's almost Marilyn Monroe levels of posing while he's in mid flow and he's almost choreographed in the way he tells his stories and their timing and the delivery of punchlines. There's definitely a rhythm to what he's doing and there's almost, even the way he smokes cigarettes and holds his glass of whiskey or whatever it is he's drinking, there's at the very least a rhythm to it. You know, there's almost a Vogue-like posing going on in the middle of his movements. That's something I think really fascinating to consider. 
a lot of other options as well for ways to consider Portrait of Jason, considering it as a modernist or an avant-garde film, thinking about it in contrast to mainstream trends. In what ways does it contrast mainstream trends? Can we think about it in relation to New Hollywood? These were students who were very familiar with New Hollywood and I suppose just very quickly the idea of the New Hollywood films centering on the angry young man type of trope. Where does Jason fit as an angry young man? Thinking about Portrait of Jason in light of its social implications and the film as social realism. It's betrayal of marginalised identities, how it handles all of that. I don't think it's useful to ask do films like that still hold up, but I think Portrait of Jason, I think because it's filmed by somebody who is sympathetic to Jason's identity, it also interrogates him. There might be questions over how ethical some of it is. I suppose as well, what something that really interests me is the idea of self-authorship and the persona, how much does he get to write and rewrite himself through the process of making this film? And what do you think of the film as documentary? Is it a documentary or does it disrupt what has been established about the nature of documentary filmmaking? I will leave you with that. Thank you very much for watching. Again, do hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next one. The next ones are where we begin to move into structuralism as long promised. And probably one of my favourites to look at is Hollis Frampton. So that will be the next video. So stay tuned for that. If you're interested in the other work that I do, you can find my blog at peablair.blogspot.com and you can check out Audiovisual Cultures podcast, which if you subscribe to this channel, you will also then get the videos relating to that. If you can support my work at all, then there is a Patreon for Audiovisual Cultures. And if you join that as a member, you can access these recordings as audio only on your own special feed. There's also some links down below where you can make one-off payments of whatever you want. And I point you towards Buy Me A Coffee because you can choose to make a one-off payment, but you can also support me with a monthly or annual membership that would just help me sustain making this work. If I start to get some semblance of a wage for doing this, then it means I can take the time to improve things and make them better. Thank you so very much again and take care till the next time.